Tá. Ok. Hi everyone. I'm, uh, my name is Mark Baketa. I'm the chief of the economic modeling and quantitative analysis section of the economic research division of the WTO. I'm very pleased to welcome you all uh, to the first event in a series of uh, webinars organized by the economic research and statistics division of the WTO on the governance of data flows and trade. Since the beginning of the digital trade, uh, digital age, economic activities in general and international trade in particular are generating growing international flows of data. These flows as well as international flows of your ideas and knowledge uh, can generate higher productivity, greater innovation and improved sustainable development. At the same time, however, international data flows raise a number of challenges for governments in the pursuit of domestic uh, uh, objectives, uh, policy objectives related to privacy, uh, consumer protection, cybersecurity, national security, competition, or law enforcement. To address these challenges, uh, governments are introducing data policies, which in many cases restrict uh, cross-border data flows. In this context, the Economic Research and Statistics Division uh, has decided to organize a series of webinars to explore three main questions. The first of those questions uh, is about the interaction between international trade transactions and data flows. The second concerns how data policies may affect international, fl international flows of data and trade. And the third question concerns the role of international cooperation in ensuring that governments can achieve legitimate policy objectives and at the same time maximize the benefits of the digital economy. This month, the two webinars will, of, will focus on the mechanics of data flows and case studies illustrating how companies are integrating data and data flows in their business practices. We have already received several questions from participants, some of which will be answered today and tomorrow, while others related to privacy and cybersecurity will be addressed in the upcoming uh, seminars, webinars. I'm very much looking forward to the presentation and the discussions. However, before I pass the floor to my colleague, uh, Lee, who will facilitate today's webinar, I would like to thank you all for participating in this event. My thanks go in particular to all the speakers, all the colleagues from the WTO Secretariat who have helped us design the program, and Lee in particular. And last but not least, to my colleague, Kian Kasegari, who is coordinating this project. Thank you all. Now let me pass the floor to uh, Lee Tuthill. Lee is a counselor in the Trade in Services and Investment Division of the WTO. She's responsible for telecommunications, ICT services, and, ele and electronic commerce. Lee, the floor is yours. Hi, thank you very much, Mark. Uh, and I want to welcome all the ladies and gentlemen who are joining us today, and trade delegates, uh, of course as well as a number of other stakeholders who have shown an interest in, in participating with us today. Uh, this webinar, this particular webinar in the series, does present um, the mechanics of data flows. And by this, we mean that we'll discuss the features of the infrastructure and services that enable data to flow across borders and around the world. Um, the concept of data it means different things to different people and different communities. Um, obviously, to some communities, it's seen as assets or commercial assets. In some respects, it's seen as statistics, for example, on people or on operations. And then there's people who talk about data in the sense of its content, uh, be it a, a service uh, or um, some audiovisual content of some kind and uh, just as information in general, which could be on about anything. This particular webinar will talk about data as bits and bytes, uh, the packets, for example, that float around, uh, flow around the world, um, and will not look at data in the sense of content uh, so much. Um, we have with us today four speakers, and I'm very, very pleased to have with us. Just as a, in, in a nutshell, let me say that we have uh, Konstantinos Komatais, who I'll introduce more properly later, but he's really a long-term policy expert on the internet, 
uh, comes from the Internet Society and he's been responsible for some very interesting think pieces uh, for some time and especially recently on the internet and its future. Uh, we have Matt Allison, who I will uh, uh, call a data guru with the Vodafone group, who's a really very ideally placed for this particular panel as he's responsible for data platforms uh, and uh, artificial intelligence within his company, things about uh, which many of us have questions. Alison Gilwald heads a, a research ICT Africa, and I've known her for many years. Uh, she's analyzed the ICT landscape in the continent from about every angle you can imagine. And um, um, at one point in her career, she was also serving with the South African telecom regulator. So she has both the telecom and the ICT side behind her. Nicholas Schubert, uh, which I'll introduce more formally later, he deals with all things digital uh, in an economic sense, both technical, uh, his technical knowledge is also excellent, which is good. And uh, he's with the Undersecretary for International Economic Affairs in Chile. Uh, let me go through a couple of logistical details for people first. Uh, please note that the webinar is being recorded and the recording and the presentations of the speakers will be made available on the website uh, that you will see in the chat box at some point uh, for the, the webinar series. Um, despite its being recording, we would like to reassure you that this is not an official WTO meeting and that any questions or comments that you may provide to us uh, will, will not be considered to reflect official views of, of your government in any way. Um, please write your questions in the chat box for, for bandwidth reasons. We're not giving people uh, the floor in a video sense, and we have, uh, will go through all of the questions in the chat box. I will convey them to panelists, sometimes grouping them together. I might also have, add that we had, in fact, almost three dozen questions come in in advance. I've supplied them to the panelists uh, before we started. And some of them, some of the questions that came in in advance, I, I realize are going to be addressed by presentations themselves. So listen if you pose some of these questions for some of the information you were seeking. In other cases, uh, we will um, reserve some of the questions that came in advance, as well as some of the questions uh, that come through the chat, the chat channel to be um, addressed uh, as when the presentations are done. Um, and we had a lot of interesting questions about the development implications. So I'm looking forward to that as well, um, to the extent that it doesn't already come up in some of the presentations. So with this, I'd like to give the floor to our first panelist without any more ado. Uh, he's the Senior Director of Policy Development and Strategy at the Internet Society. Um, and um, Dr. Konstantinos Komatis, uh, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Lee, and uh, thanks everyone. Um, hello everyone, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, I am very happy to be here. Uh, I would like to thank actually the WTO, not only for hosting this series, which I think is quite timely, but also for incorporating um, a conversation on the infrastructure. Uh, at the Internet Society, we believe that such discussions are key in order to make informed and focused decisions. So we welcome and are encouraged by uh, such initiatives. Um, so I'm not sure how familiar you're all with the Internet Society, but in a nutshell, we are uh, a global organization that uh, exists for just over 25 years. We were created by the very people who created the internet, uh, Vin Cerf and Bob Kahn um, and John Postel, amongst others. And for the past uh, 25 years, we have been working towards ensuring that the internet is for everyone and try to make sure that um, the internet operates in a secure, trustworthy uh, and, uh, and global uh, manner. We are comprised by a set of um, chapters who are grassroots and localized um, 
bottom-up initiatives that subscribe to the Internet Society's mission and they work very hard with us in order to make um, the internet available to every single person uh, on the planet. Um, what I want to talk to you about is a little bit uh, on infrastructure. Um, it's, it's going to be a little bit technical, but not really technical. I am not a techie, I am not an engineer, I am a lawyer by training. However, um, we, um, I think that it is important to set the scene in many ways for a lot of things that we will hear later on from, our, um, from the other panelists and I think in the subsequent um, uh, web series, essentially how the internet works and why it is important to talk about some of the critical properties that the internet has uh, in order and why it is also important to preserve them so as to have an internet that is uh, healthy. So for quite some time now, um, we at the Internet Society have been observing an intense regulatory movement. Uh, around the world uh, for very different reasons and for different issues, policymakers have been putting forward regulatory proposals that affect directly or indirectly uh, the internet. Some of these proposals appear to be creating some uh, unintended consequences to the internet's infrastructure, which inevitably influences its evolution, but also uh, things like data flows and all the things that this panel will be um, uh, all about. Given the Internet Society's uh, uh, mandate and mission, we have been considering how we can contribute to this regulatory activity and conversation. And uh, one of the things that we thought that we can bring into the conversation is an understanding and explanation of what the Internet really is. How does one network the Internet way? Uh, how do networks interoperate? Uh, what are the critical properties that allow this transmission and flow of that data from point A to point B? And why is it important uh, to uh, preserve them? So uh, we came up with um, the Internet way of networking and perhaps here you can go to the next slide. Uh, and we have identified a set of fundamental properties that they are needed to protect and enhance the future of the internet. These are the foundational properties of the global internet infrastructure at its optimal state, even as technologies and uses evolve. The internet way of networking, uh, that's how we call it, describes the ideal form of the global internet and the culture that it embodies. It is universally accessible, decentralized and open, and facilitating the free and efficient flow of data, whether it is for purposes of knowledge, ideas, or uh, information. So the thing that I really want to make clear is that th these properties are, are significant to the extent that they allow the interoperation of networks and they also allow uh, the data to flow. And they describe an internet that it, it is at, at its optimal state. And what we're trying to achieve with that, and I will go very quickly through each one of them um, uh, in order for you to understand more what these property, properties stand for. But what we're trying hopefully to achieve with that is that uh, policymakers and everybody else who actually does any policy on the internet will use these properties as a, as a tool. It's a toolkit, right? as an impact assessment exercise in order to be able and make the determinations that they need to make. Um, we are hoping that this toolkit is going to allow um, policymakers and governments to be focused to be in and make informed decisions when they regulate the internet and manage to gather some support about why there is such an important, it is such an important thing to preserve and protect the infrastructure of the internet. Um, each property generates some benefits. So these properties should not be seen in isolation. And this is what we also figured out through a, a lot of conversations with our partners and our community uh, of chapters, uh, that it is not just these properties that are valued, it is these properties along with the benefits that generate a lot of uh, value for the internet and could actually become uh, those information points uh, for policymakers. Uh, next slide, please. So let's take them one by one. Uh, the first critical property, and these are not are in no particular order because this is not about which property is more important than other, but it is the collection of these properties that make 
that is significant. Uh, the first property, an accessible infrastructure with common protocol. What this means is that the internet is a packet switching infrastructure with a common protocol that is the IP uh, and has a global span. Uh, the benefits of that is, of course, accessibility, reachability, and growth. Um, so essentially, it is, you know, the, the only technical tech, uh, requirement is that the computer speaks IP. Once you're on the internet, then literally you're, you become part of the integra uh, in, an integral part of the internet. Um, it provides seamless global communication. And of course, it maximizes uh, the value of the network. The second uh, critical property would be an open architecture of interoperable and, and reusable building blocks. What this means is that the internet is based on a simple layered model of technology building blocks and related services. There is um, interoperability across blocks and networks and that is very, very important because that's how networks uh, manage to remain uh, autonomous but at the same time uh, be part of the bigger network of networks. Um, reusable building blocks are widely uh, deployed to facilitate rapid innovation. Uh, these are based on open standards, development processes, and the voluntary adoption of those standards. And of course, what this does is that it allows innovation on multiple layers, new transport, new applications, security at the appropriate level, uh, etc. The third property is decentralized management and a common distributed routing system. Currently, we are talking about almost 70,000 autonomous uh, networks. Those are autonomous systems. Um, and each one of them runs uh, a common open routing protocol. Uh, and it's called, the engineers are calling it BGP, which stands for a border gateway protocol. And what this does, which is very interesting, is that it allows, it allows it to exchange information with its neighbors and build their version of the internet roadmap. Um, what this property does is, is that it provides agility and an optimized global topology uh, and connectivity. Each network, and I think that this is a very important detail that everybody needs to, to understand, uh, is that each network makes independent decisions on how to route traffic to its neighbors based on its own needs and local requirements. There is no central direction or coordination dictating how and where connections are made so the network grows organically, driven by local interests. So as long as you know, I want to send a packet from point A to point B, uh, I will interconnect with one of the autonomous networks. And if for some reason, you know, you take the package and you announce that you want to receive the package that I, the packet that I am sending and then something happens and that packet is not received, I am able to make the autonomous decision never to interconnect with you again. So uh, this system is, built, is based on trust, but this trust is very important and has worked for uh, many, many years. And that's how the, networks, uh, the network has grown. The fourth property is um, uh, common global identifiers. Um, and that is a common addressing space to ensure global reach. Uh, that means that any node can be addressed and therefore a common space shared by all globally connected nodes is essential. And common addressing, of course, supports seamless forwarding and, and, and routing. Um, the benefits of this is universality, consistency, and predictability. Um, the consistency of mapping these other namespaces to the IP space that ensures that data will be delivered to the intended destination. And uh, here, a very good example, of course, and one that you all have heard of is the dom domain names system. Last but certainly not least, um, the, the, the fifth critical property is that the internet is a general purpose network. Um, the most popular applications running on the internet have changed dramatically from its first days. Um, for those of you who, for all of us actually, most of us who have used uh, the internet for many years, uh, remote terminals and file transfer gave way to email and collaborative communication systems, which changed to web browsing and media streaming and all, that, all those things that are happening currently. And this was possible because the internet was designed as a general purpose network. It was not optimized for voice or particular usage part, uh, patterns or special traffic characteristics. 
Um, and the benefits of this property are general, generality and generativity, which are essential for innovation that doesn't require permission, what the engineers are calling permissionless innovation, um, and the general purpose naming, addressing, and routing. So with that in mind, and before I close, I would like to just note a couple of things. Um, this toolkit and the five properties here should not be seen uh, by regulators and policymakers as a means towards all ends, meaning, meaning that they will not provide answers to every single question policymakers have, but, it does pro but they do provide a very good roadmap and a good starting point on how to design regulation that is fit for purpose, and especially regulation that includes um, uh, data flows in the context of trade. Uh, and secondly, the toolkit also identifies the necessary but not the sufficient conditions uh, for a healthy internet. And what this means is that it, me it seeks to provide uh, the minimum and basic properties that must, that must exist for the internet to be able and to perform its intended functions. So for instance, you might notice that security was not there. However, that is uh, quite intentional because even in the beginning of the internet, security was not perceived as um, a critical property because you cannot foresee every single security um, uh, uh, vulnerability or gap. So as long as you have a flexible system that is agile, which comes from these properties, then you are able to address your security concerns. Um, I will stop here uh, and I am very happy to, and look forward to the conversations. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Constantinos. And uh, I think it's very useful for us to start on, on this footing. Uh, pick up on something that Constantinos said about uh, that the job of the internet is to get things from point A to point B. And for this reason, um, I have invited uh, Vodafone to be with us because increasingly we're using uh, uh, mobile telephony, not just as a, a as a network for for voice and uh, calls and 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 text messages, but it's also become many people's major source of accessing the internet and a variety of services. Um, and I think it's really the job of any internet provider, um, whatever technology, is to get things. Um, from one place to another as efficiently and as affordably and as safely as possible. And I look forward to hearing from Matt, um, who is Senior Public Policy Manager uh, for Data Platforms and Artificial Intelligence with the Vodafone Group. Thank you, the floor is yours, Matt. Many thanks, Leah. And I understand somebody's gonna throw my slides up on the, on the screen for people to see. Um, if you just go through straight through to the agenda uh, slide, um, and I'll start there. And uh, actually, I alighted on exactly the same term that you had um, in Constantinus's brilliant introduction, the, the access point. So essentially, the service that we're providing is, is access for our customers, be they business or consumer, to the distributed architecture, which has been described very well, I think. Um, so what I've been asked to do today is to provide um, a bit of an overview uh, as to the, the, the ways that um, an MNO like Vodafone transfers data across borders. Um, so as well as describing a little bit about the way that we store and transfer data internally and externally, um, I wanted to provide some slightly broader reflections about the, the value that we think this presents and in particular the focus on sharing and reusing data where possible and with the appropriate safeguards to maximize its value. Um, and this is certainly a commercial priority for, for Vodafone um, and something that we're not alone in focusing on. Um, and to describe a little bit about the, the principles that we put in place that we think will help um, facilitate enhanced sharing of data um, and to look then at the regulatory landscape um, and in particular, uh, interventions from policymakers that can help either facilitate or uh, conversely can actually make it harder to share and transfer data uh, across borders. So if we could just skip to uh, the first, first slide. Um, so I'm sure you're uh, familiar with Vodafone, um, but just in case anyone isn't, um, we're a global telecommunications company. Uh, we're responsible for connecting over 650 
million people, uh, organizations, businesses, and things um, across this, uh, this kind of wide network that we call the digital society. Um, uh, if we move on to the next slide, I just wanted to speak uh, quickly about our geographic coverage. So we have operations in 25 countries, um, concentrated largely in Europe and sub-Saharan Africa. Um, so within Europe, uh, we have a mobile network spanning 116 million customers, uh, fixed networks reaching 145 million households spanning 13 countries. Um, outside of Europe, we're a leading provider of 4G connectivity. Um, we offer a number of payment and e-commerce platforms, including uh, M-Pesa and the Mezzanine platform. Um, if we could move on to the next slide. Uh, so yeah. On that. Yep. Um, all of which means uh, a lot of data. Uh, so both in terms of the, uh, the, the bits and bytes that traverse our network every day, allowing our customers to interact with the digital services that, that, that have been mentioned, um, but also in terms of the data which is generated in the process of delivering that service. Um, I thought it would be useful on this slide just to call out a number of interesting um, facts and figures in relation to this. So um, you know, for example, uh, over 7 million data users, uh, an average of 2 gigabyte smartphone data usage per month uh, in Africa, uh, 7.2 million converged uh, customers in Europe, and most interesting, I think, on the right-hand side, 103 million IoT SIMs connected, which is up 23% year on year. Um, and I think this illustrates Matthew. the fact that... Hello? Sorry, Matthew. Uh, sorry for interrupting. The slides are not visible to either okay. us or the or the attendees. So I'm sorry to interrupt. Though there are a lot of people putting this on the chat. Thanks, Constantinos. I was just trying to figure it out if it was me and say something myself. <laughs> okay. It, it's uh, it's no problem. I can I can share them afterwards if that's if that's agreeable. So yeah, I'll, I'll just, I'll work through and then, yeah, as I say, we can circulate the slides afterwards. Um, but I think the point that, that's useful to illustrate is that as well as uh, connecting people, we are increasingly moving towards connecting things um, and the, the data economy that surrounds that internet of things proposition um, is quite compelling. Uh, and we're really looking at ways that we can, um, as I say, maximize the sharing and reuse of machine generated non-personal IoT data. Uh, uh, so, you know, looking at the, the, the data that crosses our networks, the data that we process, it's quite uh, important, I think, to try and separate out the different dimensions and data types um, across what we would call the, the data value chain. Um, and I've included in the slide deck that you'll see afterwards um, a screen grab from a GSMA report uh, on the same topic, um, which illustrates quite nicely the different dimensions and data types uh, that we need to consider as a business. So moving from personal to non-personal data and looking across volunteered, observed and inferred data. Um, uh, and the key here is that each layer, there are a set of tasks and functions that need to be fulfilled and opportunities for value creation that can be realized. Um, and the key char characteristics of data uh, in this sense are that really differentiate it from other commercial assets that companies might look to utilize are the fact that it's non-rivalrous um, and, and therefore the same data can be shared and used again by multiple parties generating new value at each stage. Uh, we have in place a data strategy to, to maximize the value of data across our uh, value chain um, which has sort of two distinct components. The first is our internal data transformation um, and the second is our external data monetization. So, you know, looking internally, uh, we have a data governance team who are working hard to uh, get full visibility of the way that data um, is, is collected across our footprint and where possible to move those data pools into common cloud platforms where we can apply AI and advanced analytics techniques, which will uh, allow us to create a kind of um, optimization to ensure that the data that we, that we store is, is done so in a way which is efficient and drives, uh, drives value. Um, externally, we're also looking at ways that we can build on our enhanced sort of core services of connectivity to offer new digital products uh, and solutions. Um, so, for example, in Europe, we have a location insight service, uh, which we have provided uh, for a couple of years now, and has actually proved um, very useful in the context of the coronavirus pandemic, being able to uh, provide governments with aggregate and anonymized insights on uh, population movement. And this was possible because we'd invested in the underlying AI and data analytics uh, techniques and capacity. 
Um, so for both this internal data transformation and external data opportunities, we're utilizing aspects of big data processing, AI enhanced analytics techniques to generate new value from customer biz work, business network and IoT data. Um, and I think this really underlines the point that there is a significant data opportunity here. So we uh, commissioned Deloitte a couple of years ago to model the economic benefits, uh, particularly of business to business data sharing in a number of industrial sectors. Uh, and they found that actually sharing a machine generated non-personal data would add uh, up to 1.4 trillion euros in economic value to, to the EU economy by 2027. Um, but realizing this value depends in the main on the successful sharing of B2B data between and across organizations. Um, and really that sharing and reuse is, is the key to this uh, realizing uh, of the, beta, the, the, the value that exists there. Um, in order to, to help achieve this, um, we've set ourselves a number of internal data principles. Um, uh, these were actually released at the same time uh, as the, or to coincide with the Finnish EU Council Presidency data principles. Um, uh, and designed to help stimulate the European data economy. Um, just a couple of highlights. We look particularly at uh, voluntary measures to incentivize data sharing, um, consumer-centric policy that puts users in charge of their data, um, and also trustworthy by design technology platforms and services have privacy by design, uh, really build into the underlying fabric of the, uh, of the products and services that are being offered. Um, in addition to the work that we're doing internally on our data principles we're also very active uh, in helping to uh, influence and shape the regulatory environment around cross-border data flows um, and I think key to this uh, is the fact that data in itself does not recognize international borders um, and the ability to maximize the value of data is really predicated on being able to move data seamlessly uh, across borders take advantage of the globally interconnected nature of digital supply chains um, and so in order to achieve this, we are supportive of measures taken by governments to help facilitate the cross-border flow of data. Um, and in particular, we would point to within the European single market action taken by the European Commission to ban unjustified data localization measures within the single market um, in the form of the free flow of data regulation that was passed under the previous Commission's mandate. Um, and we're looking keenly, I think, at the international environment to, to move beyond our focus on the single market to understand how governments can help to facilitate data transfer um, in a way which has privacy and security built in. Um, and there's certainly a role for, um, uh, you can look at uh, bilateral and plurilateral, plurilateral trade negotiations um, between uh, for example, the EU and Japan, um, which had an adequacy agreement um, built into that, that, that trade agreement as a good example of this type of cooperation. Um, so in that instance, baking in fundamental uh, rights protection to, to agreement that guarantees data can flow seamlessly between the two economies. Um, and of course, we're also then um, looking very keenly at the work that's taking place at WTO to kickstart e-commerce trade negotiations. Um, uh, and see if countries can work towards a global agreement uh, on data flows backed up by robust protections for citizens' data. Um, before closing, um, I just wanted to mention, I think it really the elephant in the room uh, for any sort of policy professional working on data at the moment, the, the recent um, verdict of the European Court of Justice, uh, which invalidated the legal mechanism which had been put in place to transfer data from uh, Europe to the United States, uh, privacy shields, um, but also raise serious doubts about the, the wider use of um, legal uh, mechanisms called standard contractual clauses. Um, and this is something which not only our business, but many other companies are working at the moment, and I'm sure we will discuss more in the Q&A, um, but it does raise the question of, um, as international businesses, is the onus being shifted more firmly onto private sector organizations to uh, essentially vet the countries to which data is being transferred. Um, and that, that leads to particularly, um, I think some talking about the private privatization of data governance, which would be a concerning phenomenon. And we're really looking to government and regulators to offer clarity in this space for how businesses can um, implement the, uh, the, the European Court of Justice ruling um, in a way which allows data to, to transfer across borders as seamlessly as possible. Um, I'll, I'll close there and happy to answer any questions in, in follow-up. Um, back over to you, Lee. And as I say, we can circulate the slides afterwards and uh, apologies for those not being, not being available. 
Thank you very much, Matt. Um, that's an interesting perspective that, that I think is very useful to all of us. Um, and I'm sure there'll be a lot of questions that you can help us with uh, at the end. Um, I'd like to introduce Alison Gilwalt, who is the um, Chief, uh, the, the Executive Director of Research ICT Africa, uh, which is a nonprofit public interest think tank. She also is adjunct professor at the University of Cape Town, Nelson Mandela School of Public Governance, where she's also in charge of the uh, doctoral program on digital economy and society. Um, Allison, please, I see you've got your PowerPoints up. Thank you. Uh, Alison, you're on mute. We're not, uh, yeah, turn off your mute, Alison. Sorry, sorry, I'm pushing it and pushing it, but now it seems on. Um, so I was just going to say, I've got a number of slides um, and uh, I'm only going to do what I can in the time available. Um, so Lee, please do indicate when we have to, right, have to come I will. in. Um, but um, I just thought uh, we could, you know, it would provide some reference points for people to go back to. And of course, it refers to some reports of ours that you can also um, look at. Um, but I really wanted to speak a little bit about the, um, let's see why this is not um, sharing. There we go. Um, so very, if, if time permits, I'm going to try and look at the issues of, of digitalization as opposed to datification, which are often confused in our policy discussions and the particular challenges that those raise. Um, in, in relation to um, globalization and trade, of course, um, and then really speak about the challenges of digital readiness for us um, in Africa to benefit from these um, digital processes and the value add that goes with them. Um, we you know, really need to do something about our, our digital readiness. Um, and we need to do that if we're going to improve Africa's visibility on global markets and value chains. I won't have much chance to speak about that, but just to highlight that that's what obviously the objectives of the Af African Continental Free Trade Agreement in terms of regional integration, African integration, but also in global markets. And then I'm going to speak a little bit about this digital inequality paradox, because this brings us to the same point every time we can discuss you know, the infrastructure um, deficits or the infrastructure successes that we've had. Um, we can discuss affordability, we can just discuss all of these things, but as we layer, you know, increasingly advanced technologies, um, we, um, you know, are, are, are more and more confronted by this challenge. So, you know, really the critical policy challenge at a global level. Um, I look at some supply and demand side policy the outcomes to see where we are in terms of digital readiness, looking at penetration, use, price and quality if there's time, some implications of exclusion for development and of acceptance of countries of open data flows and um, while those development challenges are there and trying to understand how those can best be addressed by addressing some of the institutional and regulatory bottlenecks to improve our um, you know, supply side constraints. Um, but then also from um, a re really a global governance point of view, as we're dealing with global data flows, the need for much greater global cooperation for the delivery of these public goods that Matt was referring to, non-rivalrous you know, data, internet, et cetera, that are not realized at the national level um, under existing conditions. And then, importantly, um, I know we've been asked to stick to the mechanics of this, but, um, you know, the issues of digitization, the issues of um, e-trade um, are, from a policy point of view, intrinsically linked to the potential around taxation, about building our revenue bases, uh, our taxation bases in Africa for the increased social protection we're going to need as we move into digital markets and, of course, in post-COVID um, economic um, recovery. Um, Sorry, I'm just not having any luck moving my screen on. Let me just go there. There we go. Um, so, um, so I just wanted to say, you know, obviously it's recognized in many of our, our, our policy documents, our continental policy documents, the importance of digitization um, on, in, in international trade. Um, representing innovative opportunities for African countries to increase efficiency, diversify, you know, value added products, expand regional global trade, um, lower the cost of production, change um, dynamics of commodity dependence. All of these are realized and we see them reflected in the African Continental Free Trade Agreement, which was meant to come into force this year. Um, also um, 
prejudiced like the global digital tax by, by COVID, but likely to happen towards the end of the year or in 2021. Um, and then very present also in the African Union digital transformation strategy. I should say that e-commerce and digital trade in the African Continental Free Trade Agreement is not mentioned specifically, but is coming up in, in the third round negotiations, has been um, put on the agenda for the third round of negotiations. And it's very much about you know, um, enhancing um, uh, trade and, and trade flows. Um, and, and data flows. Um, and the problem with this is that many of, many of the countries are on signatories to these agreements. The African Union Digital Transformation Strategy, I think currently only has five countries um, uh, signed off on it. Um, and as same with the you know, cybersecurity law, the data protection, um, the, the Malacca conventions, et cetera, very small numbers of African countries actually signing off on these in terms of implementation. And so many African countries are really unable to capitalize on the economic welfare gains associated um, with digital transition. And then I just did want to make a, a, you know, a special point about um, datafication, because I think that's obviously the very important context in, for, for data flows, but also about you know, the, the gig economy and platformization where value is actually being generated um, at a global and of course, hopefully in, in time at, a, at an African and, and cross um, African level, trans-African level. Um, but I mean, I think the point is that, you know, many countries aren't signatory to these things. Um, there's a lot of, um, you know, talk about data sovereignty, data localization. But the point is there's actually no opting out. You know, this is a global economy. It's moving this way. You either find the ways to harness it that will benefit you to meet all those objectives I spoke about earlier, or you are cut out. And many countries who are um, you know, basically adopting sort of protectionist, protectionist positions don't actually generate enough data like China to be able to do, you know, they have an internal econ data economy or um, are able to even um, uh, you know, beneficiate um, the, 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 the limited data that they have. So um, I think there's, you know, we, we really need to understand the, the, the global dynamics of these processes of platformization, of course, the competition issues, et cetera, that go with that. Um, but just to understand that, you know, that the, the data is now the key resource um, for consumption and production um, in this economy. And it's, you know, it's, it's more than the oil because it's not a finite um, uh, resource unless we make it so, um, as was mentioned. And it's really a critical asset that underpins any modern economy um, if we are hoping to go that way. So um, really what these um, challenges highlight is the need for policymakers in developing countries to view digitization in the context of global markets and value chains, but also within their local context. Obviously, this is very important. If under existing conditions, um, you have these enormous information on data asymmetries, etc. It is obviously going to present um, challenges around who benefits from, the, from these data flows and who doesn't. Um, and the main challenge here for African countries is their lack of digital readiness. As I said, if you, you, know, if you have to get on the boat, you have to join this um, you know, global movement, you, you then have to prepare our markets far better than they are. And so the lack of digital readiness really constrain, constrains the ability to, to leverage these new technologies and processes productively. Um, what they do need to do, and this is, as I said, not in place across the continent, is also mitigate the risks that are associated um, with these new um, in international services that, and, and technologies, particularly challenges around um, you know, employment, data governance and rights, privacy was mentioned in, in previous ones, um, previous presentations, and of course, you know, the need for complementary policies to really make, to be able to um, beneficiate and get the value add from, from data flows, so access to finance, etc. cetera, all pretty, a critical part of this policy discussion. We can't really just discuss the supply side issues or the infrastructure issues on their own. And then of course, you know, digital inclusion in developing countries is absolutely critical um, and certain, within certain sectors of the developing economies to increase their visibility um, in the wider um, value ch chain. Um, and so this really reinforces the need to develop, you know, domestic responses that associate themselves with these global conversations and to be able to represent the interests of um, developing countries and the challenges that they face within, within these um, discussions. Um, and really, you know, the, the, the core policy issue, and that's what comes up, you know, whenever we, you know, we, we're looking at any aspect of, of, of global communications and of national communications and of subnational communications, is this digital equality, inequality paradox. I mean, it comes up very strongly within the so-called, you know, fourth industrial revolution discussions on artificial intelligence, etc. But even with, you know, with the internet, 
um, even with the, the basic internet in Africa, what we see is that, you know, as more people are connected, um, digital inequality increases. And this, this is not, I'm distinguishing this simply from a digital divide that we used to speak about when we were speaking about voice. The connected and the disconnected. Once you connected people, they had a greater advantage than the disconnected. Yes, we have that. But because of the inequality around the way we are connected, we also have inequality between those who are online and those who are offline, but those who are barely online um, and those who have the technical and financial resources to use the internet productively and even to prosper. Um, and of course, you know, as I said, this is really um, what is reflected in the inequalities that we currently see around opportunities to harness um, uh, data and, and uh, the processes of digitalization and datification in order to um, uh, have beneficial outcomes, positive outcomes. And of course, what we've seen, you know, we've always known that this, um, you know, digital inequality actually reflects structural inequality in our um, economies and societies. Um, and that to really address digital inequality, you have to address some of those fundamental things, human development challenges. Um, but what we've seen with the um, uh, pandemic and the lockdown is the compounding effects of this, so that those people who don't have the opportunity to mitigate the effects of COVID through you know, digital substitution are now even further you know, uh, worse off than they, they were before. And so the implications of this for, you know, are very significant as we move towards the African Continental Free Trade Agreement and the transformation strategy, because that's really what we have to address. We have to address this, this digital inequality paradox. Otherwise, you know, the benefits of, of market liberalization, of trade digitalization, of um, increased trade across the continent will only, um, you know, benefit those who are, who are, who are ready to, to, to do that. And so we'll see increasingly, you know, um, more marginalization of groups. So very quickly, if we look at those indicators, what we see is that, you know, broadly, this is from our after access survey that we do with Learn Asia and Dersi and Lata. Um, in, uh, is that we see that um, broadly, you know, um, uh, internet penetration tracks GNI. Um, we can see that, you know, there's some incongruities with that and often these national figures mask um, inequalities, you know, the, 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 the aggregated data masks inequalities. So South Africa, you can see there, although it's right up at the top with mobile phones, actually the internet penetration is a lot lower at only 53%. This is in 2018. Um, and that really reflects the, the incredible inequalities that we have in the country. Just very quickly, of course, the GNI also it broadly explains the, the, the gender gap and the um, urban and rural gap. And I should point out that the urban gap, a rural gap actually is, is still bigger than the, the, the gender gap. Um, because what we find from modeling this data is that you know, men and women of a similar education and income broadly have the same access um, and use of the internet. They obviously do different things, but they broadly have that. So in you know, developing countries that have high levels of penetration, they actually have greater parity. And so you see the gender gap is, is, is much smaller. There are some cultural dif you know, differences in many of the Asian countries and in very big populous countries. Um, so these barriers to use, um, you know, basically what people are always looking at the price of data. Actually, the data is a, a challenge, an affordability challenge for those who are, um, uh, connected, but our big challenge across Africa is, is who's not connected. So if you look at these, um, the, the pictures that I showed you earlier, you will see that Rwanda, which has, you know, incredible supply side um, measures and gender measures, I should add, has, you know, less than 15% now, um, at that time, less than 10% um, internet penetration. Um, so, uh, you know, the, and, and, and I should add that it has, you know, over 95% broadband penetration. So the, you know, the challenges of we have to look beyond the supply side challenges. If we only look at the infrastructure and services side, we are not going to be able to address the problems. The problems are really on the demand side. We know that people have access to the um, um, internet or those who have education, income. They're the people who can afford it. They're the people who can, who can buy the devices. Um, and so, uh, you know, it, we have to address these um, bottlenecks, these regulatory bottlenecks, these policy um, lags and implementation problems that we've had around releasing spectrum, you know, around um, wholesale access regulation to dominant operators in various markets. On the infrastructure side, there are a number of things um, that we have to deal, deal with. And as I said, the main challenge is actually around smart, you know, the smartphone device, which most people um, across the continent um, cannot afford, and equates with internet um, uh, penetration. Basically, the people who have smartphones are the people who are connected. The cost of data, you know, it's still a big problem across the continent. 
But the problem is that in those countries where it's actually been politically reduced or forced down or through some kind of price war or something, and is, you know, people are really not rolling out, uh, operators not rolling out networks anymore, et cetera, because the prices are so low or not investing in them to get the right quality, um, they are still not affordable for people. So we really have to be, look at our um, business models, our licensing models. We have to do something differently. It's not working as, as we currently have it. And then, of course, as we move into the data environment, the quality of service is absolutely critical and so when you're comparing those prices you need to compare you, know, you need to know what you're comparing so you might be comparing you know a very um, iffy um, sort of 3g connection somewhere compared to you know a high quality um, 4g connection somewhere else in terms of a data price um, and the, the quality of these connections is obviously very very critical not only around mobile data but that's where most people access the data but from a data and a business point of view obviously the fiber net are also important and sorting out rights of way and making sure that we get um, the fiber extensions into, into um, outside of the main metropolitan areas. These are all um, enormous policy channels, challenges for us because the problems of not being connected are, you know, are, are, are too significant or too big for us. Um, we've, got to, we've got to address them if we're going to see those benefits of, of, of continental trade and, and international trade. But the problem is that in fact many of the countries even when they have reached the 20% critical mass that is identified in the literature, penetration and use, um, to enjoy the network effects associated with GDP um, growth, et cetera, um, we're not seeing it. So some of many countries are still way below that, but even the countries, Kenya, um, Nigeria, South Africa is way above that, um, that have reached these critical masses, we're not seeing the same kind of network effects. And that really brings us to proper probably the idea of of the intensity of use you know if people if the assumptions around these models are that people are always on you know, excellent connections and um, but in fact in the african condition people are you know buying a little bit of data for a short bit of communication and then going off um that's going to really affect their their um their, their usage etc and of course you know the uh, this is the outcome of the policy uncertainty poor you know ineffectual um regulation of markets which have had negative impacts on investments in some countries but I should also say speaking about Africa you know as one country is very problematic some markets have done very well on this some markets have done less well some markets operators have kind of circumvented um, you know regulatory bottlenecks to do to roll out service, excellent services in other markets they haven't been effectively regulated and are dominant in the market and not we're not getting the consumer welfare gains that we would see there but the real challenge in terms of you know the, the, the um, datification of the economy and the beneficiation of the economy lies in our um, low levels of human development, which affect both you know absorption from a, a user point of view, from a you know producer point of view, from a government point of view, um, and then from an innovation point of view. So these are really big big challenges for us. Um, and so I, I think I've run out of time, so I'm not going to be able to, to say um, much more for us, but I think you know, what we have to do um, looking forward is ensure that all policies are geared towards maximizing the potential of the digital economy and mitigating the potential risks and costs. That means you know, creating the trusted environments we need for this to happen. Um, we need to harmonize our um, systems with global systems of governance, um, but we also have to uh, you know, rectify issues of digital inclusion and if we we're going to optimize um, the development impact of these new um, technologies. Um, and so, you know, we really can't go back to doing the same thing. I think really COVID has given us all the opportunity to reflect, to reset. We need to look at what we haven't done that has affected reg effective regulation and do it. We need to look at what we've been do doing and isn't working. We need to look at the current business models. We need to look at the exclusive licensing frameworks. We need to look at the extractive rents by governments through retrogressive and irrational taxation. And we need to look at the um, you know, um, rent extraction by companies um, in these markets as well. Um, and just finally, because I'm not gonna have a chance to speak about it, I think you know, selling this integrated, um, uh, transversal policy that you really need in order to um, you know, get African inclusion in global trade, etc. Um, you know, we really have to look at it in terms of the total um, macroeconomic environment and the um, linkages of trade to taxation, particularly the digital global tax that would um, enable countries to get revenues, build their tax braces for um, you know, increased social protection that's going to be needed, but also to just um, grow, grow our economies and um, safeguard our citizens. 
Thank you, uh, Allison. We're pretty close to time, and I think we, we, so we don't have to skimp any on the time for Nicholas to talk. He uh, is the legal advisor to the Undersecretariat uh, for International Economic Affairs in Chile, and his experience both in trade and in negotiations, as well as in digital issues, is, is pretty impressive. And I'll give him the floor so we have plenty of time for questions. And he's done. Thank you very much, Lee. Um, Alison, may I ask you kindly to allow yes. me to share my screen, please? Sure, I'm trying to get off. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Nevertheless, I'm not able to share my screen. Oh, I, I can see your screen. I can see you it, can but I'm not seeing a full picture. Let me start everything again then. Off. Try again, Nicolas. Okay, yes. I have a... No, that's also not right. There. Are you able to see my screen, the, yeah. the slide? Yes. Yes. Okay, very good then. No, um, 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 thank you very much for having me today. Um, and, and, and thank you for that kind introduction, Lee, and also for organizing this uh, very timely seminar, I would say. Um, as, as, as some panelists uh, mentioned before, um, uh, everybody's in the business uh, of regulating the internet today, but um, many of us uh, lack uh, perhaps uh, the technical understanding uh, that is uh, so important in, uh, in these issues since, uh, well, uh, some of you might be, uh, uh, might know the, uh, the dictum code is law and, and, and this is uh, applicable to uh, the internet and uh, also to trade. And uh, that's a little bit what I want to talk to you about today. My presentation today will be around the Chilean experience uh, with data flows and uh, a particular kind of trade object. And I'll try to explain why data flows are important uh, to it and um, how this has allowed us to uh, democratize a little bit uh, the participation of people in, in the global uh, economy. Um, so, so bear with me while I do so. Um, to answer the question posed by uh, the title of uh, my presentation, why are data flows important for trade? Um, I first would like to talk a little bit about the meaning of electronic commerce so I can better explain why we think data flows are not only important, but uh, ac are actually essential, particularly from a developing member's uh, perspective. Um, the work program on electronic commerce that was adopted by the General Council in 1998 uh, some years ago, uh, states that uh, for the purpose of that uh, working program and without prejudice to its outcome, the term electronic commerce is understood to mean first production, second distribution, marketing, sale, or delivery of goods and services by electronic means. From this definition, we can see uh, there is a really broad range of things that fall under the scope of this definition, but I think it's useful to make a distinction between traditional electronic commerce and uh, digital trade. This distinction is based uh, on the objects traded in each of these kinds uh, of trade. When we usually think of uh, e-commerce, we think of goods that are marketed and sold through electronic means. For instance, uh, you, buy, uh, you buy a pair of shoes that are related delivered to you by a shipping company and uh, this might happen in a domestic or even in a cross-border way uh, where data flows can serve to better coordinate all the import export processes and keep all the actors involved up to date of the operations so they can avoid delays. This is one area where sharing data is important and the trade facilitation agreement has a lot to offer on that front and uh, Alison Gilbert uh, just ex explained some of it. What I would like to highlight today is the existence of the of, of trade in other objects, digital trade, electronically transmitted content, or digital products, as uh, some people call them. Digital trade holds, to my mind, the clearest and most direct promise of achieving a global and open market, free from ba trade barriers and discrimination that will allow us to democratize the global economy for everyone with a good idea and a connection to the internet. 
This sounds like a cliche, and it certainly is, but uh, we've seen here in Chile empirical demonstrations of this. For instance, we have a vibrant community of video game developers that are being able to export their products directly to foreign markets, thanks to data flows and the internet. But uh, what makes digital trade so powerful? The answer is the transformation of traditional physical containers in which traditional trade objects had to be embodied into ones and zeros. This means that what you use to require a physical media, such as the paper of a book, for instance, the plastic of a music CD or a DVD, now only needs to be transformed into bits and bytes to be a trade object. At the end, everything that can be converted into ones and zeros will be sooner or later, perhaps sooner than later, and even some things that will take a physical shape at the end will be traded as ones and zeros at some point. Think, for instance, of 3D printing. Richard Posner, uh, the famous American jurist and economist, indicated the following characteristics of the digital economy. If you want to, uh, to look at the paper, um, it's, it's, it's down there in my slide, and the slides uh, will be uploaded. Um, the digital economy is characterized by falling average costs over a broad range of output, uh, modest capital requirements relative to what is available for new enterprises from the world uh, capital market, very high rates of innovation, quick and frequent entry and exit of actors, and economies of scale and consumption, also known as network effects or network uh, externalities. The, these characteristics of the digital economy um, have created a particular uh, market where once a digital product is created, it's cheap to reproduce, store, and distribute thanks to the internet. This has created a market phenomenon called the long tail that is represented in the yellow part of this, of this graph in front of you. Traditional markets with physical goods had to be focused on having goods that were interesting for a wide spectrum of consumers. Think, think for instance, that you owned a bookstore. Uh, you would probably put things in your shelves that you knew that you, that you could sell uh, fairly easily. Uh, this is represented by the head of the graph, uh, the vertical axis in red, where you have your hits, products that are aimed at uh, mass markets. The long tail comes from the fact that reproducing, storing, and, distrib and distributing digital products has a marginal cost close to zero, so you are able to, div to diversify your products and serve many niche markets. This creates more opportunities for people that have been traditionally excluded from participating in the global economy due to the high entry barriers that international trade has traditionally represented for, for them. This is something that, uh, at, at least in, the, in our regional uh, case, in the Pacific Alliance, has moved us to establish a digital market in the Pacific Alliance, where uh, we uh, believe that uh, we have the opportunity to offer a lot of uh, interesting digital products uh, to uh, the members of the Pacific Alliance, uh, thanks to this new niches that uh, can now be served uh, due to this uh, phenomenon of the long tail. Um, but for this promise of having a truly global and vibrant market where anyone can participate in, uh, we need to make sure that the underlying infrastructure is able to function in a very particular way. Konstantinos explained some, uh, some of this during his presentation. And I'm talking about a global network of terminals, servers, cables, switches, routers, standards, protocols, and software, uh, represented here by the first uh, two layers, the, the two lower layers in this very simplified uh, layered model that I that I've put here, that make up what uh, we know as the internet. This is basically the internet. If we want the promise posed by digital products to be real, uh, we need to recognize that the internet has a particular influence in how markets that use the internet as a platform to operate are influenced by the technical architecture decisions that uh, we make. And this brings me back to my comment about uh, everybody is in the business of regulating the internet, but uh, not everybody understands how the internet works. And uh, I think at least the trade community should have, have a better understanding of it. Um, in this regard, if the trade world wants to take advantage of a global and open platform where anyone can participate in, we need to acknowledge that data flows are essential because that is the way the internet works. The internet was devised as a global and open platform that moves data packets from one end of the network to another end of the network. As Lee mentioned during her introduction, when I talk about data flows, I might have a different understanding of the term that, uh, that, that other people might have. People tend to associate the term data flows with personal data and ask themselves, why would I want my data moving freely across borders? And to my mind, uh, this is not what we're talking about here. Data flows is about how the internet works by moving information, data packets. 
Therefore, we need to think of policy implementations that recognize the way the internet works, but obviously leave room for exceptions when we don't want certain kinds of data to move freely across border because of the nature of, of a particular kind of data. Um, there is, so to say, um, a gender species relationship uh, when we talk about data. Uh, there's, uh, there's a general understanding of data. To my mind, that's data packets. And we should have a general rule that uh, permits the free flow of data. But if there are policy concerns or legitimate concerns around a particular kind of data, personal data, sensitive data, and so on, we should uh, narrow the exceptions and make those exceptions applicable um, even at the proper uh, technical layer, I would say. So having the telecommunications layer uh, as a general rule that can move data packets, but if there are any particular uh, concerns, where, where one could address them in the, in the, in the proper layer. Um, what, have, uh, what has Chile uh, been doing uh, in this context? Uh, we have incorporated some core provisions into our trade practice. We've been um, having many, many discussions with, uh, with many people around the world on, on, on these issues. And the first thing uh, that we think uh, is useful is to have a provision that recognizes the ability of the internet to move data packets. This is nothing else as a recognition of the internet's technical architecture, the way the internet works. And as I mentioned, uh, there might be certain situations where having exceptions to this rule could be beneficial to protect some types of data, but those exceptions should be uh, really narrow because uh, it could go against the technical architecture of the internet. Another element we believe is important is not mandating localization requirements in order to allow the sale of a product or service. This is also something deeply connected with the technical architecture of the internet. And it's also a, a pragmatic approach that allows Chilean exporters to use the cloud services that, bet, uh, that best uh, fit their needs and capabilities. Uh, this is just an example. Uh, uh, cloud uh, services are just one, ex one example of why uh, we think that uh, having a broader choice uh, of, uh, of services that one can rely on uh, is a good thing. Recognizing that there is a trade, uh, that there is trade in products that should not be discriminated against in a national treatment kind of way is also uh, essential. Uh, that's what I mean with uh, non-discrimination of digital products or applications. And uh, the applications part uh, makes perhaps a, a, a reference to uh, not discriminating against uh, certain services, certain applications. It's more, uh, it comes perhaps from a, uh, and I know this is a, 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 a contentious term uh, from a network neutrality uh, uh, perspective, but uh, we also believe that network neutrality is part of maintaining a, a, a free competitive market and therefore it should be also uh, included in, 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 the, in our trade practice. Um, finally, we've been looking really closely to the relationship between trade policy and competition policy. Um, to my mind, there's an historic disconnection between the two fields where competition policy has always been considered a domestic issue, uh, while trade is called to govern cross-border relations. But since the digital economy is born borderless, we need to reconcile these two fields since both of them aim at the same objective, maintaining a free functioning market. Um, and this to me also asks uh, for looking at the role of intellectual property and its role as a promoter of innovation and creativity in this uh, dematerialized world. Is, is intellectual property uh, serving the purpose that it should be serving or, or, or should we have a, also a look at that? Um, just to wrap it up, uh, so to, I want to stress some really fundamental ideas that we have been following uh, during, during uh, our latest uh, practice. Uh, we believe that the internet should, should remain a global and open platform for trade. Uh, and this is achieved through uh, certain, certain uh, trade provisions, but uh, I would say uh, the, the trade venues are not the only way that we should maintain a free and open internet. Data flows are the way the internet works, and therefore we need to recognize that and include this. And the more open, global, and non-discriminatory the platform is, in this case, the internet, the more people can uh, participate. And, 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 and this is really important to us from our developing country's perspective. That's it. Thank you, Nicholas. Um, I, I want to get to questions right away. We're just about, uh, our timing is, is all right. I wanted to um, take a couple of uh, short statements about uh, what to expect from questions. 
we have um, a number of questions that have come up in the chat that are very important and related to competition. And there is, in fact, a, a webinar, um, I think, next month, uh, more dedicated to the competition issues. Uh, taxes came up in the chat box, and, and we won't be addressing that directly, at least, in our webinars. But that's not to say that the WTO isn't following these issues very closely internally. And uh, um, there are some obvious uh, trade issues going on between our members, uh, which probably means we're a little more sensitive about that. And somebody mentioned cybersecurity, which is also the topic of a webinar coming up uh, later in this series. So they will be covered separately. Um, there was an issue as to whether you know, technology issues should guide social regulation. And I, I think uh, there was a response uh, to that question already that no, that's not really the issue, but there should be some consciousness of, for example, the different layers. And this particular layer uh, should theoretically be, be functioning well for people to take advantage of it. Now, there was a couple of questions that go toward what the WTO should or shouldn't do and what uh, are the WTO rules about certain things. Um, our approach in, in this series of, uh, of webinars is that we invite experts to talk to us, many of us are trade people, and that we take that information from experts in their areas and then it's our job to pretty much figure out what the implications are for the WTO and, and what WTO rules apply. So I, I know um, um, uh, at least Nicolas, is, Nicolas is, is also a trade person, but it's really not our remit in this panel to make judgments about what WTO uh, rules do say or don't say and what WTO should or should not do. Um, Chile, uh, uh, Nicolas gave an example of what Chile is doing um, and, and that's uh, about as far as we go. Now, we had a number of advanced questions that I grouped into various areas, and I thought I'd, I'd ask a couple of those first. If any panelists had saw a question they were particularly interested in addressing, we had some questions more about infrastructure and technology, and uh, then we had a number of questions about um, development. Uh, and here I'm, again, avoiding some of the questions that I think panelists may have addressed already in their presentations. Now, we, we have a question I think is interesting about somebody mentioned in, in the chat, um, edge computing, and I think that was also submitted in advance. Uh, and then there's also some, some questions having to do with cloud computing and or server configuration and location. Uh, does, does these have any implications for, you know, the, 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 how the infrastructure and how the networks work. Um, there may be some um, competition implications because networks are, of course, what economists would call a networked industry. But um, why don't we go with some of the technologies first? Because I think it's important that um, because trade people aren't experts in technology, we talk a little bit about is, is edge computing make a difference? Uh, are we moving again towards edge computing or away from edge computing and now will that mean that data is naturally localized um do, does cloud computing um have an effect on the way the network functions and 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 how people can take advantage of it and finally um um what is the cost uh, formulation for servers i mean do do um, our servers always uh, all over the world. Uh, how are decisions taken about what to put servers? Um, if companies uh, want to have their own servers, is, is that something that is prohibitive in cost? It's a bag of questions, but more oriented toward the technologies that are coming on. Any panelists want to take up that? Uh, briefly, before passing the floor to the panelists, Lee, can you define edge computing for our audience, please? Sorry, yeah, edge computing is more where the 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 um, equipment at the end of the network or the consumer's equipment does the processing. Now that was pretty much uh, routinely the case in the old days, and uh, then we moved towards you know intelligent networks and more processing could be done within networks. The cloud can now do data processing. But there's some people seeing a move towards very powerful handheld devices, for example, that can do a lot of computing on site. And is the data captured there? Do people have more control over their data? Is the network configured differently if we go toward edge computing? Um, so it, 
instead of the, the, the basically central location doing the computing, edge would mean that the computing is done in, in, the, com in the consumer's computer or handheld device. Um, um, I think I think I think to your question on, on on edge computing, edge computing is is, is well uh, well as you mentioned, um, a way the internet uh, used to work uh, in its early days, and then we moved to uh, centralized data centers that uh, process uh, data and so on. Um, to my mind, uh, edge computing is something that we should strive to maintain. It has it has a lot of uh, technical implications, uh, lower latencies, and and and, and faster uh, faster access to that uh, information. And and I think from the architecture perspective, it's also good that uh, these kinds of operations. Uh, are done at the edges of the network instead at uh, at the center of the network. So uh, because this also has certain certain implications for uh, um, perhaps in a competitive way, uh, the decisions are finally made at the edges of the network instead of at the center of the networks, and the users at at the edges of the network. And therefore, uh, I think that we should strive to uh, maintain uh, that that uh, that, uh, that uh, architecture. Um, I, I don't believe um, it's bad to have uh, centralized processing units or the storage units or whatever it is, uh, data centers, for instance, um, as long as, long as uh, it respects uh, this, uh, this central uh, architecture that we have uh, of the internet um, as being able of moving uh, bits and bytes from point A to point B. Um, without uh, without getting into uh, the data uh, itself, um, respecting also respecting uh, the data itself, I think I think I think that's fine. Let me ask um, uh, Matt Allison uh, about, about servers. I mean, how do how do operators make decisions about how many servers to have, where to put them, and and what would the logic be that would make sense to an operator? So I think the yep. the commercial perspective would be. So I'm just checking that I'm not muted yet. I think the um, the commercial perspective would be um, in terms of where servers are located and uh, where data is stored and processed. The first point is you know where it is um, commercially expedient and where it is um, you know able to best guarantee the privacy and security requirements that are necessary uh, in, in the given in the given country. Um, the the question of edge versus kind of cloud computing i mean a personal reflection i have is that cloud computing isn't going anywhere anytime soon um and i think all businesses at the moment are increasingly looking at ways that they can um, centralize data in order to apply ai and data analytics techniques to it to derive insights that they can put to use um as i've mentioned either for kind of internal optimization of um, the data they, that they hold or looking at kind of external opportunities to um, to better monetize some of the data that they hold and I, my feeling is that that isn't going anywhere anytime soon i, I know the, the european commission actually um, has set sort of set out as part of its overall narrative and strategy on data that increasingly um, more processing will be done at the edge and that will actually be um, a way that uh, you know we can kind of encourage this concept of data sovereignty within the european single market um, we may be on a journey in that direction, but yeah, my, my personal reflection is that's not going to happen overnight or certainly anytime soon. Um, but, but I think the, the point that I would return to is that, yeah, the decision on where, where data um, should be stored and where servers, uh, servers are located from a commercial perspective, um, it needs to be based on that sort of cost calculation um, on a local assessment of the regulatory environment. Um, and what is unhelpful commercially um, is where rules uh, are put in place, which put a, um, I think that the word that the European Union uses is quite an interesting one, an unjustified data localization requirement or mandate. Um, and that's where more effort needs to be given over from a business perspective and how to navigate those rules. Um, and where I think you've seen quite consistently, um, certainly the technology industry 
asking uh, policymakers to push back on those unjun unjustified data localization mandates um, and to do what they can to put in place um, agreements, agreements that facilitate cross-border data flows so that the, the, the server, as you've said, um, or the data processing can take place where it, where it is most secure and most expedient to do so. Um, and I think that's really the key to um, taking advantage of the globally interconnected nat nature of digital supply chains and the fact that you can make use of centralized computing power to derive new insights from the data that you hold to create optimization and ultimately to, 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 yeah, to realize the value of uh, data, the, the data that you process. Lee, if I could just come at that from a slightly different angle. Um, I, you know, I, I, I think that this in global interconnectedness is, is extremely uneven. Um, and so when the decisions are made purely on commercial grounds as they are, we have, for example, you know, all of the um, data flow from, from, from Africa, um, you know, peering in London, Amsterdam, maybe a few other points, but you know, a significant amount, like over 75%, I believe, um, that, of that peering actually happens um, through London. And that obviously if, if, um, you know, um, reflects our trade flows as well, is that you know, we don't have sufficient intercontinental trade, and so we don't have the you know, um, same kind of data requirements. We can't get the scale and scope that we can get by um, you know, peering, um, at, a peering at, a, at a peering point in London, or having servers in London, or where, data warehouses, or whatever it is. Um, so really part of, you know, addressing this um, these trade imbalances, part of addressing these um, information flow imbalances, etc., are really around um, very proactive um, stimulation me mechanisms, demand stimulation mechanisms in the continent in order to, um, you know, get more traffic um, uh, in between countries, etc., but also through, you know, active supply side measures like regional exchange um, uh, um, internet exchanges and that kind of thing where we can, um, you know, uh, keep some of that data, some of that flow, and of course improve the latency and stuff because no matter how, what quality we have, we still have enormous um, latency challenges, which can really go to a point somebody I think was making in the chat of, um, uh, you know, local um, content delivery um, networks or the caching that's being done now, um, you know, at, at, at regional levels to try and um, yeah, just not, you know, <laughs> spending all our, um, our time and money kind of, you know, tromboning between um, different continents. So hopefully with the African continental free trade movements, greater, tr you know, intercontinental trade, we're going to see um, that uh, more, at, you know, data flows actually um, happening on the continent with um, exchange points and, uh, you know, da data um, warehouses on the continent. And if I just may very quickly just second um, uh, what Alison just said, that, you know, when we're talking about the, all those specialized networks, right, because essentially we're talking about specialized networks and we're seeing an increasing amount of specialized networks, they don't always uh, make sense in all geographical contexts. And I think that Alison was spot on in mentioning exactly the, ch the challenges that currently are faced in Africa and we as an organization are working a lot with the African region in actually setting up those exchange points uh, because we do understand that traffic, it, it makes no sense for traffic to go, um, you know, through London in order to be able uh, uh, for African people to access uh, the, 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 you know, the content that they want and the information that they need. So it is very important. That's why the, the conversations about infrastructure become so very important because, you know, it, it, we need to understand that there is this underlying um, infrastructure of the internet that unless we support it, then we are going to have those access gaps and we're going to have those trade issues and we're going to have all those discrepancies that are currently happening and that are not helping really the digital uh, divide. And so on top, however, of all the uh, e-commerce and trade issues uh, concerning data flows, I would also like to point to the you know, traditional uh, trade. When we are, it is very important that countries realize that it is, you know, setting up an IXP requires some equipment to get into the country. So getting that equipment into the country will also uh, need some flexibility in trade rules in order for the equipment to get on time so it doesn't stay, for, in, for instance, in some warehouse for six months before it gets used. Because by the time after six months it, it is released from customs, for instance, it might not be usable. And those equipments are not expensive. However, they get easily, if they're not used, they get easily um, 
um, you know, they, they cannot be easily used afterwards. So it is very important to understand that. And finally, the last point that I want to make is that we, we are talking a lot about edge, edge computing and cloud computing and all those things, of course, have provided efficiency and speed and user friendliness and, and all the other rest of the stuff. However, one important question that we need to keep asking is how much do they interoperate with the public internet, right? And how much they become their own islands whereby they don't need the public internet and suddenly they lock in um, users and consumers in the name of efficiency and speed and user friendliness and call it whatever you want. So it is very important to actually have this at the back of our heads in order to, because that's the only way. One of the benefits of the public internet is that you don't need to ask anyone, you know, you just can connect and you can do all those great things. You need to be able, we need to be able and have a conversation as to how much of those critical properties, if you want, that we've discussed in the beginning are also identifiable or should be identifiable in specialized networks. Thank you, um, Konstantinos. Uh, I think that there's an interrelationship between some of these questions about technology and also accessibility of developing countries. So um, I, let me just move on to some of the some of the most generically a number of questions said, well, how do how do developing countries basically get more infrastructure? And and that's been addressed indirectly and, and by getting that infrastructure uh, theoretically benefit more from data flows. Um, and the thing is, I guess people are asking who's, who can help, how, how does help take place? Uh, I know that ISAC is doing a lot of work on some areas and uh, I think that uh, mobile phone companies have basically gotten communications technology in the hands of an enormous amount of people. I'd like to know what Matt thinks the answer is to basically getting communications out to people. And I'll just note quickly that Allison had uh, suggested, I, I, at least yesterday to me and, and perhaps in her presentation as well, that there are some countries that actually have uh, the technologies like 5G in place or broadband in place. Uh, it's available, but uh, it hasn't achieved the penetration people would have liked. And, and what are the reasons for that and how can they be addressed? Who'd like to go first? Well, I think if I could just follow your, your invitation um, there, like just to reflect as a, as a service provider um, whose you know, mission statement resides really in connecting people and things across our footprint, um, of course, broadening and widening that access to digital communications is something um, that, that we're very supportive of. Um, and I think part of your question was to reflect on, well, how do we do this? Um, and I guess we would return to the, the investment climate and the regulatory framework um, in, uh, in the markets in which we operate or would look to enter. Um, and ensuring that there's, I guess, that kind of collaborative approach between you know, the government and the private sector to ensure that um, companies can put in place the necessary investments in the underlying infrastructure. So, you know, having, having the, um, the, 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 the kind of next generation or high capacity networks that we need to enable greater access to data intensive services. Um, and that absolutely comes back to ensuring that there is, you know, um, a kind of uh, grounds in which we can invest and ensure a return on, on that investment. Um, in, in markets and that comes down to a variety of different things so it could be market structure it could be you know getting access to sufficient spectrum um, it, you know it also comes down to as far as we're concerned the relationship that we have with digital service pro service providers that run on top of our network and ensuring that there is sort of a level playing field in terms of the regulatory environment that exists there um, and a combination of those factors uh, I think is you know, what we need and gives us the certainty to put in place those investments that will ultimately allow more people to connect and to consume data-rich services. Okay, well, I, I, I'm told uh, theoretically there are two minutes. It, theoretically, there are two minutes left in, in our session. I'm not sure if it sort of blows up and we're cut off. Um, let me just ask uh, if anybody else has, uh, has a couple of words to put in on this. Uh, Nicolas or... or uh, Allison? 
So I just wanted to, um, again, just provide, you know, I think the, the mobile operators have done an enormous amount in connecting people that were never connected before. Um, we are, because of, you know, the um, high costs associated with, um, you know, um, data networks and rolling out data networks and their constant, you know, um, um, upgrading and new generation networks, um, together with not very effective competition, means that we're not seeing the, you know, optimal benefits of this for the majority of people. Um, so I think there's one point at which we have to look at that investment environment um, that Matt was speaking about. Um, I think we also have to, um, uh, you know, balance that with what is actually required in order for countries to more, you know, equitably um, enjoy the benefits of these and for them to be there and available for development. And I think that really requires a fundamental adjustment to the commercial supply side only evaluation of our resources to looking at you know, demand side valuation of these resources, because those are absolutely critical if people are going to become, you know, if there's going to be inclusion, economic inclusion into the economy, is actually looking at what, you know, yes, we do need 5G for the advancement and the evolution of these services, but what other complementary lower cost technologies would be available that we could roll out? What about not having national exclusive licenses and allowing smaller players to enter into the market, you know, put pricing pressure, deal with, you know, um, get, develop niche markets, community networks, etc. So we really have to move out of the sort of old telecom and national infrastructure thing into this far more dynamic um, environment that we're in that will create um, services and you know high quality technology but but um, services that will meet the different needs of different people um, at different costs while at the same time you know creating this um, uh, um, data protection trust environment addressing the human development and challenges to address the demand side um, aspects of this as well. Okay, thanks. Um, I think we're pretty much out of time and I noticed that some questions, uh, some panelists have replied to questions within the chat. So that's been very useful, thank you. And I want to say to all the speakers, I thank you very much for making yourselves available. I, I think it's been a very stimulating discussion. Um, and as has been the practice for other trade dialogue lectures, everything will be put online and, and we'll put some of uh, links to some of the information. I'm hoping, for example, that we can put a link to cons uh, Internet Society's work on, on regulatory impact assessment as well, uh, which I look forward to learning more about. And we, all of the participants, uh, we can see you tomorrow at 3 p.m. for the follow-up on this, which actually some of the kind of questions that came up today our panelists tomorrow should also be able to address those in a very practical sense. So we look forward to seeing uh, all of you and more tomorrow at three o'clock as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lee. Thanks, hey, everyone. Cheers, Thank Lee. you. Bye-bye.